Welcome, everyone, to episode four of True Crime All the Time Unsolved. I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me, as always, is my partner in true crime, Mike Gibson. Gibby, what is happening? What's going on, everybody? So, Gibby, we're taping on a Friday night. We both had a long work day. We did. But we're in the studio recording, and that's the way to do it. Absolutely. I wouldn't have it any other way. Love it. All right, Gibbs. We got to get into this Natalie Holloway case. Right. I remember this one well. Oh, I think a lot of people will remember. It was a really big case, right? It was. And I mean, it was the, on every media. Yeah, I was going to say the media coverage for this case was insane. Right. It, it grabbed the nation. You know, like some of the other cases we've we've done, but, you know, for unsolved, for an unsolved case, this one really garnered a lot of attention. So you've got a young girl. Yes. That's just graduated high school. She goes missing on foreign soil. You've got a bunch of different mysterious suspects who are saying all kinds of crazy things. Yeah. And you've got Natalie's parents who are doing everything in their power to try to find their daughter. So you've got all these elements that are just ripe for the Nancy graces and the, Oh yeah. The Fox news, the HLN CNN. Right. I mean, it was, you know, it was big. So we got to start with a little background of Natalie. You know, Natalie Ann Holloway was born on October 21st, 1986 in Clinton, Mississippi. She was the first of two children born to David and Beth Holloway. Now David and Beth would divorce in 1993 And Natalie and her younger brother, Matthew, they would be raised by their mother, Beth. In 2000, Beth would marry uh, George Twitty, as they called him Jug. Not sure why, but they called him Jug. So George was a prominent Alabama businessman. He had some money, Gibbs. Yeah. And the family moved to, uh, to Mountain Brook, Alabama. Pretty nice area. Very nice area. So Natalie would graduate from Mountain Brook High School with honors. She was a member of the National Honor Society. She was on the dance squad. She participated in just a lot of different, you know, school activities. Yeah. Very intelligent young woman. Yeah. She was intelligent because she was uh, scheduled to go to the University of Alabama. Full scholarship. On a full scholarship. Yeah. So what was she she was going to major in pre-med, right? Pre-med, yeah. yeah so I she mean, had the world, I mean, basically in the palm of her hand. Right. She was going to do, you know, some amazing things. At the time of her disappearance, which obviously was what this case is about, her her biological father, Dave, he was an insurance agent for State Farm uh, back in Mississippi, and her mom, Beth, was employed in the uh, the same school system sc- district that Natalie went to. Okay. So that's kind of the background on Natalie. And then we really just got to jump right into her disappearance. Jump into their senior trip. Yeah. What a nice senior trip, by the way. Uh, yeah, I didn't have anything like that. Mm, no. I went to Panama City, Florida one year. but uh, Yeah, this is different. This is Aruba right. we're talking about. So we're talking, yeah, so Thursday, May 26, 2005, Natalie and a hundred and some, right, over a hundred of her fellow graduates, they arrive in Aruba for a five-day graduation trip. Now, the teenagers were accompanied by some chaperones. Yeah, like like a half a dozen or something. Yeah, there was six, not, seven, eight. Not a lot for... For a hundred and twenty, whatever it was, kids, yeah. But they did have chaperones, right? And apparently, it was said that the chaperones would meet with the students each day to ensure that everything was going okay. But they weren't there to keep tabs on every person every second of the day. Yeah, and it would have been impossible given the small number of chaperones right. versus the number of students. And it wasn't a. F- it wasn't really an official school trip anyway. This was yeah. stuff that the clearly the parents signed off on letting their kids put it all together. Go, yeah, sure. yeah. You know, this is this was the next step of 
being kind of independent before you go off to college. Yeah, according to student reports that would come out afterwards, you know, there was a lot of heavy drinking, a lot of partying, which, you know, you would expect on, Yeah, I can't say I didn't do. People not in the same room every night. Yeah, I can't say I didn't do a lot of that right. myself at that age. Probably sounded like a lot, a lot like your spring breaks. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm assuming it was a lot like that. Yeah. It got so crazy that I read um, that the Holiday Inn that they stayed at had already told them that, Hey, you, you don't come back here next year. You're not right. welcome. Right. That, that's, it, it must've been a pretty crazy scene, pretty wild. but anytime you have 120, whatever, it's going to be disruptive. It's going to be very disruptive. Right. You know, I think that the drinking theme and the partying theme, you, you got to stay, you have to talk about that because it's central. Absolutely. You have to talk about it because, you know, I mean, there was accounts that, Natalie was uh, seen drinking morning, noon, night. This kind of plays into the whole story. It does, and and you know, obviously, we're not we're not bashing her at all. Absolutely but not. These are accounts from fellow classmates that said, you know, she would wake up and have a couple cocktails and would drink sometimes so much at night that she never made it to breakfast. I mean, those are the kind of stories that came out afterwards, but she was there, she was having fun and yeah. she wasn't the only one. No, I, mean, I think they, they basically said that most of the kids were drinking in excess. Right. Yes. And, and right. And kind of what you expect from this type of trip from, from everything we've heard yeah. and read about. Yeah. I think we've, we've all been there. So Natalie and several friends were out drinking and this is the last night of the trip. And they meet a Dutch individual by the name of uh, Joran Vandersloot. And Joran is going to be central to this whole episode. I mean, this whole case, I don't want to say the whole thing revolves around him, but he's a central figure in almost everything we're going to talk about. Absolutely. So Joran was a student. Yeah, 17. He was on the island living with his family and attending the Aruba International School. Natalie and and several of her friends, they were they would meet him and several of his friends later that night of the uh of the Monday the 30th. As we said, that's the last night of the trip. And they met at a bar called Carlos and Charlie's. Yeah, been been to that bar before. Have you? Yeah. Absolutely. There is nowhere you have not been. There's people, places I haven't been, but I've been there. Okay. They blow the whistle, pour the sangria down your throat. Have you been to the this in Aruba? Aruba. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because you know they tore it down. We're going to talk about that. I don't know about it, but I've been to Aruba. And okay. I've been to Carlos and Charlie's. You must have been back in the day. Back in the day. Oh, oh it's been a long time. A long time. Also stopped at Barbados on the way. We learned something every episode yeah. about Gibby. Yeah. So this is late at night. It's one thirty in the morning. You know, they're drinking with, with, uh, Euron and his friends and they leave with them. Now his friends are two brothers, right? Ka- Kalpo brothers. Yeah. Uh, Deepak and Satish. Satish. So they leave with them and this is where the story goes awry because Natalie's never seen again. No. And, Everything you read pretty much indicates that the last time she's seen alive is with these three individuals riding in Deepak Kalpo's silver Honda. So Natalie had been scheduled to fly home later that day. Remember, we're talking about 1.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. She's supposed to get up and hop on a flight to go home. She never makes that flight. No, and And, they even say her luggage is packed and her passport's actually in her room, right? Her passport's not on her. Her passport's back at her hotel room. Right. So there's her passport, her ticket, and her packed suitcase. Right, so she must have packed her luggage. Night before? Before she went out. Yeah. Because she knew she was going out. She probably didn't want to do it when she got up that next morning. Right. She was going to be probably a little hungover. Just wear what she had on? Yeah. Okay. So I I think that's important, right? It's not like 
I think that rules out the fact that something happened to her on the way to the hotel, on the way to the airport, because she would have taken all that stuff. She would have had her passport. Right. So now the window closes, right? The, yep. The window of time closes from one thirty to six in the morning. Yeah, I would think whatever time she probably would have uh, ske- would have been scheduled to get up. And right. I don't know what time her flight was scheduled to leave. But none of her classmates knew where she was. And it's at this point that one of the chaperones calls up Natalie's mother, you know, back in Alabama and says that Natalie's missing. So Natalie's mother, Beth, immediately calls 911. She calls her husband, George, and then she calls the FBI. So she was not messing around. No, she didn't play around at all. To further that fact... She was on a plane to Aruba by 5 p.m. Yeah. I mean, they didn't mess around. Her husband. Not one bit. Used his business connections, got a private jet. Yep. Right? And they boarded it. And then within three, four hours, they were in Aruba. Yeah. Now, they had. That day. They had some means that most people don't have. Yeah. But they used them. Wealthy. And yeah. they got to Aruba quickly. Now, in the meantime the Aruban authorities are doing some searches. They're trying to find Natalie uh, all throughout the island. They're searching some of the surrounding waters, but they're, they, they did, they're not finding her. Let's talk about the early investigation. You know, one, one thing that I think is very interesting, it's really within hours of, you know, Beth and, and George landing in Aruba that they're able to give police the name of Jor- Joran Vandersloot. Yeah. I mean, they know his name very quickly. So they find this out before the police even find it out. So Beth would state that Joran's full name was given to her by the manager at the Holiday Inn. Okay. So she gets that information and she provides it to the police. Why didn't the police find this out yet? Or they weren't taking it as... Probably as severe as Beth was at that point. Well, I, and I think we'll talk about that, right? We're, Cause that comes into play a lot. Right. You know, what did the Aruban police do? Sense of urgencies. Yeah. What was their sense of urgencies? They took a lot of flack and, and we're going to, we're definitely going to talk about that. And we got to remember their methods as far as criminology versus the U S is going to be different. Oh, definitely. On how you pursue things and, and people's rights and, and and so forth. And that does, you know, that plays out as the story unfolds. Right. We're not in the United States. No. And for that's, sure. And that's where you, it gets even trickier. So the next thing to happen is that the, the Twitties, that's George and Beth. Right. Um, because obviously she's remarried to George Twitty. Beth of course. Is. But they go, and they've got some friends with them as well. So... They go with their friends and two policemen to Vandersloot's house. All right. Which is, to me, a little strange for the person to go with the police. Seems a little strange. Obviously, they're looking for Natalie. They already believe that Vandersloot is the last person or one of the last people to have seen her. Uh, Joran, you know, talking to police. He initially denied that he even knew who Natalie was. Sure. Or had any idea or had been with her or Placed anything on. like that. Yeah. Then he he tells the police a story. And Deepak Kalpo, which we we know was one of the people that was last seen with with uh, allegedly last seen with Natalie, is there at Vandersloot's house happens to be there and he backs up this story. And the story is that they drove Nat. They were with Natalie the okay. night before they had driven Natalie to the California lighthouse area of this place. That's called a Rashi beach. Uh, because as they said, Natalie wanted to see sharks so it's nighttime, <laughs> which seems strange to me that they're going to go to this place at nighttime to try to see sharks before she goes back to her hotel. 
which they claim they dropped her off at 2 a.m. All right. So she's dropped off at 2 o'clock, according to them. Yeah. But that, that timing to me seems strange because we've, we already know that she's seen leaving the bar at 1.30. They're dropping it off, her off at 2. That's a fast trip. I don't know how far this California lighthouse is. Yeah. Now, we're on an island. Yeah. So. It's, and it's not very... The distance is not... It's not a big no, island. But still... To get in a car, to go get there, there, get out. Were you walking right to the edge and going? Oh, yep, there's shark. a shark. Let's go. Yeah. Plus the the chance you're going to see a shark at two a.m. Don't think you will. But. That's pretty uh, pretty remote, I would think. Right. So we've got that story, and then he goes on to say, Yorn does that. Natalie falls down. She's so drunk. You know, as she's getting out of the car, he tries to help her, but she tells him to get off of her and they drive away. But as they're driving away, they see that she's approached by a dark man in a black shirt. And they describe it as being looking like one of the security guards. Sure. So we know at this point, there are about a few hundred volunteers scouring the Island, trying to help locate her. Yeah. Um, and, And these are, People from both Aruba and the U.S. Right. A joint, kind of a joint effort. Volunteers. And I remember them talking about this on the newscast that, that the, uh, the government, the Rubian government, you know, did allow the civil servants to have the day off to go out there and help as well. You have to give them credit, right? The government is trying to do their very best. Yeah. Or at least... They're putting that foot forward. I mean, now, you got the you got the Dutch Marine out there helping. You got the local Reuben banks, you know, raising money to help to help the search. So, I mean, everybody's like you said, they're putting their best foot forward, trying to find this you know young lady. Yeah, and and it's so it's so strange that they they would come under fire later, but it seems like from everything you read in the beginning that they're doing nothing but. Their yeah. very best to try to locate her. Yeah, they're they're cooperating and making trying to make things happen at that time. So the first reports, Gibby, that come out, you know, they're indicating that Natalie did not appear on any surveillance camera footage right. from the her hotel. Uh, I guess from the hotel lobby uh, during the course of that night, and you know, Beth, who Beth is a very central figure. She is. I mean, she She's very involved, very involved. Yeah. If you remember, she was on the, <laughs> she was on the news a lot. And so you really have what I would call two central figures. You have Beth Holloway, yep. Twitty, yep. and you have Yoron Vandersloot. To me, those are the two central figures in this story. Now, Beth made varying statements. She made some statements about whether the cameras were actually working that night I think at one point she said they weren't. At another point, she might have said they were. The police commissioner said, and I guess it didn't matter, because she Natalie could have got to her room without going through the lobby. Yeah, there was more, guess. more, more, more than one way to get to the room. Yeah. So if she wasn't on, if they had video and she wasn't on it, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Yeah, right? I, I think they were trying to say that the fact that she wasn't on the video didn't necessarily mean that she didn't somehow make it back to her room. But I think we know she didn't make it back to her room, or at least, you know, that's, that's the thought. So they're searching for evidence in this case. And, you know, by all accounts, it was very extensive and it led to some false leads though. You know, one, one piece of evidence they had was, a possible blood sample that was taken from oh Deepak's yeah car. Deepak's car yeah it turned out to not even be blood at all no it was I think just, it was just false hopes there yeah I think they were they were excited about that but it turned out to to not be anything you know I think we have to talk about the involvement of the American government and American law enforcement you know it was pretty extensive it was for this kind of case. You and I talked in a previous case, and now I can't remember which one it was, on our regular podcast, True Crime All the Time, about 
what they call missing white girl syndrome. Exactly. And that is going to come up. That comes up again in this case with a lot of people saying that the only reason why a, there was so much media coverage is because this was a wealthy white girl. Yep. And B, the amount of support, volunteers, government, U.S. government. The right. only reason why there was so much involvement was, again, because this was a, a wealthy white girl. And I, I don't know how much credence there is to that, but in a couple of these cases that we've talked about, there's a lot of information and there's a lot of examples to back it up. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of chatter on this. Yeah, I mean, you can you can search that uh, missing white girl syndrome, I think is what it's called. Yeah, and if you do, you will find hundreds of examples of African American women in all kinds of different situations, and you'll probably find one similar to to a lot of these things that we talk about. Right. And it'll be pointed out that this that it's handled in a much different way. That's that's all I'm going to say about that. I'll leave it up to the listeners to do that. I think because her mom and stepdad were pretty affluent, you know, and had political ties. I think that that drove this one more than people realize. I think it did. But I also think, yeah, you have the other things in place as well. But uh, yeah, I, and, to, and to, again, to get that level of cooperation through the United States government to the point that Condoleezza Rice gets involved. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty huge. It's not, it's not the ambassador. It's not, this is Condoleezza Rice. Secretary of State. Yeah. She's actually in constant contact with the Aruban authorities. Yeah. That's pretty huge. Right. So you've got some connections. But anyway, like I said, I, I don't yeah. I don't bring it up to start some big war. No, 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 no. But I, I think it's important for people, you know. But if, that perception's out there. That, that perception is out there. Yeah. And I, it might be more than perception. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll leave that up to the audience. Yeah. I'll leave that up to the audience. Right. Right. To, to figure out how they want to weigh in on it. But there's it's definitely, definitely out there. There's definitely a lot of examples to yeah. to point in that direction. Gibby, I mean, it's it's not very long before some initial questioning and even detainment happens with, with suspects. So on June 5th, the police detain Nick John and Abraham Jones, who were security guards or former security guards. Right. I don't know if they were still active or yeah, at the, what. I think they were at the hotel across the street. Yeah, a nearby hotel which I think at that point was closed for renovation. And maybe that's why they were former security guards. I don't know, but they detained them on suspicion of murder and kidnapping of Natalie Holloway. Yeah. And officially the reasons for the, these arrests have never been disclosed, but I think you have to point to the statements of Joran Vandersloot saying that the last time he saw Natalie, she was being approached by, and I think he said one. I thought he said one man. Yeah, and he did. He he said wearing all one, black, one dark, one dark man, looked dark like male, a, and uh, yeah, looked like a security guard, right? So somehow that that threw suspicion onto these two individuals. There there was more to it, right? I mean, they, were, they had a little background. They had a history of allegedly cruising hotels to pick up women, and one of them had some type of prior incident and was on law enforcement's radar. They were never charged and they were released on the 13th. Now that's eight days. Yeah. But that's, that's part of this. Uh, another side of this case is that the detention time that they could hold people was pretty expansive, M- much different than it is in the U S absolutely. Right. You have a short window of time to hold somebody. Yeah. And or if you, you don't turn them loose, if you don't charge them, yeah, you got to turn them But down loose. here, you know, in Aruba, over here in Aruba, they it's a little different. Right. So that that's our that's the first people that they thought were suspects, but they were released, never were never charged. On June 9th, which is during that period, right? It's right. basically halfway between the time that the two 
former security guards were arrested and released, uh, Joran Vandersloot and both of the Calpo brothers are arrested. Yeah. On suspicion of kidnapping and murdering Natalie Holloway. So basically, as of June 9th, they've got five people arrested. Yeah, or detained. Yeah, however you want to look at it. Right. I think they were arrested but never charged. The first people were arrested but never charged, right. technically. And like you said, the, the law down there allows for arrest basically just on s- suspicion Yeah, from investigators. They can hold suspects for a much longer time. The, there's an increase in the burden of evidence as that time goes on. So apparently there's a, a, a review that happens every so often that the person is being detained. And you have to have sufficient amount of proof or... And if you don't, then they have to be let Cut them go. loose. Yeah. yeah. I read that the reason that they you know, arrested those three is because immediately after being notified... And we're aware of Vandersloot and the brothers. They started tracking them, right? They started wiretapping them. They started uh, doing surveillance on them. And that was their justification on picking them up and bringing them to the, to the jail. Yeah, it was. But I never, I never got that the monitoring of their email or the, or, or the wiretaps, did it produce anything? Well, that's the weird thing about this whole case, right? We There's so much information that's not told that, you know, they say they did these things, but they'd never say this is what we found. found. Right. And then you have things like this next statement that happened on, you know, June 11th by the uh, spokesperson for the Reuben Minister of Justice, where he comes out and he says that, you know, Natalie's body the location is known and she's dead yeah he comes out and and basically says she's dead and he's a high-ranking person right but then he retracts that so how do you feel about that especially if you're the parents yeah so you're saying you know where the body is and she's dead but then you're telling me oh no i misspoke so his statement of retraction basically said that he had received some misinformation that's some pretty serious misinformation. Yeah. If you're going to go out and say, yeah, we know she's dead and we know where her body is. At that level, you confirm everything before you open your mouth. Yeah. One thing that was interesting that, that I wanted to talk about. So, you know, they arrest Vandersloot and, Cal- and the Calpo brothers. And it was said by the police that it was pressure from the Holloway family that caused them to stop their surveillance prematurely and to detain the three suspects. So that might have answered our questions about what did they get from the, the wiretapping and the emails and the surveillance. I think they're saying we didn't get anything yet because we wanted to keep, we wanted to keep it going, but there was so much pressure from the Holloway, from Beth Holloway and other outside forces that we had to pick them. We had to arrest them. But why was they, why would they pressure if they didn't think that they had some solid information too? Uh, again, uh, but we don't know. Right. Again, I think unknown. that's, that's where a lot of the scrutiny on the government down there comes in. You know, I think they did some good things, but I think they also did some things that raised a lot of eyebrows, you know, just like, what you said, this David Cruz guy comes out and says that she's dead. It's kind of like a, reminds me of like a Barney Fife kind of, uh, right? I mean, Aruba is not a huge country. It's not a big island. So it's, I mean, it's small. Yeah. So it's almost like getting this happening in some small U.S. town where it's the good good old boys. And or, or just or Or just police officers that aren't, Versed in this type of yeah, very procedures. well trained. It's yeah. not something they go through a lot. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, if they don't if they don't have this happen a lot, right? I mean, it's hard for them to do the job that needs to be done versus calling in this, you know somebody in the, on the state level. So the police chief would come out and say that one of the detained young men, which has to be either Yoron, Satish, or Deepak, admitted that something very bad happened to Natalie, 
after the suspects took her to the beach and that the suspect was leading police to the scene. So again, he's coming out and saying that they're really close to finding out what happened. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty important information that he just said. Almost a confessional type yeah. information. Yeah. Now, the very next morning, though, uh, there's a spokeswoman for the prosecution. She she refused to confirm or deny any of that, simply stating that the investigation was at a very crucial, important moment. Yeah. So, again, so those are two very different. Talking about missed handling of communication. Yeah, and mixed signals. So we got to go up to Friday, June 17th. Yeah. Because now a six person is arrested and it's a disc jockey named Steve Crows. The media was told that Crows was detained based on information from one of the other three de- detainees. Okay. So again, we're going to get into this down, but they're telling all kinds of crazy stories. Yeah. And I think part of the, all this, and it gets even crazier as we go down. Oh, right? sure. I think that's part of the thing have the police looking everywhere else, but where they need to look, right? Keep throwing out bizarre stuff. Get them chasing this way. Throw them down that rabbit hole. You know, on, on the June 22nd, the police would detain, uh, you on father for questioning and they would arrest him. So that's what six, seven, that's the seventh person that is so far that's been arrested. Now, both his father Paulus and Crows, the disc jockey, they would be released on the 26th. Right. So his father was kept for four days and this disc jockey was kept for nine days. That That's a long time. It nine is. days. That is in, a long time to be detained. If you're comparing to the, to the U S system. And, and it was really during this time, you know, as we talked about that, the suspects that they had were telling all kinds of crazy stories you know, they were naming different people, which is why certain people got brought in and right. questioned and arrested. Well, and they're working the suspects against each other at this point, too. Yeah. All three suspects, though, indicated that Joran Vandersloot and Natalie Holloway were dropped off at the Marriott Hotel Beach. Vandersloot, can, he did state he did not harm Holloway. He left her there on the beach. So went from looking at the sharks, his first story, looking at the sharks at one between one thirty and two and bringing her back. Now he's saying that they came back to the Marriott beach area and hung out on the beach. And then he got up and left her there. Right. So that's at least two versions. Right. He said, see you later, beautiful blonde and left. And then you've got a third version that comes out where Vandersloot says he was dropped off at home and Holloway was driven off by the Calpo brothers. Okay. So he's not even involved anymore at this version. Now on Monday, July 4th. So again, now they've been detained for quite a while. There are some hearings before a judge and both Calpo brothers are released, but Vandersloot was not, and he would be kept for another 60 days. Okay. That is a long time. That's a long time. Not to be technically charged right. with anything. Right? I don't were they charged? I think I think at this point they're just arrested. Yeah, they're just arrested. They haven't been charged with right. anything. So they're being he's being detained for another sixty days. Yeah. Now the release of the Calpo brothers does not make Beth Holloway happy. And I want to play some audio from her. It is now that I ask the world to help me. Two suspects were released yesterday who were involved in a violent crime against my daughter. These criminals are not only allowed to walk freely among the tourists and citizens of Aruba, but there are no limits where they may choose to travel. I am asking all mothers and fathers in all nations to hear my plea. I implore you. Do not allow these two suspects, the Calpo brothers, to enter your country until this case is solved. Do not allow these criminals to walk among your citizens. Help me by not allowing these two to get away with this crime. It is my greatest fear today that the Calpo brothers will leave Aruba. 
I'm asking the Aruban officials to notify the United States State Department in the event these suspects try to leave this island. I'm asking all nations not to offer them a safe haven. I'm asking this in the name of my beautiful, intelligent, and outstanding daughter, who I haven't seen for 36 days and for whom I will continue to search until I find her. Thank you all so much. Uh, obviously, Gibby, she's in serious pain. Absolutely. But what happens as a result of that press conference is it pisses off a lot of the people in Aruba. Yeah. And there are demonstrations and a lot of people turn against her for the comments that she's made, basically saying that the Calpo brothers are innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. And she's saying that they're guilty. Right. When they haven't been charged and convicted. And that leads to this. I would like to apologize to the Aruban people and the Aruban authorities if I or my family offended you in any way. It was never my intention to do so. And as the Aruban people, they, they have been extremely kind and generous and especially supportive of myself and my family during this tragedy. I realize that the Aruban legal system abides by the presumption of innocence, and I want to reassure everyone that I do respect the Aruban legal system. The statements I made on July 5th were fueled by despair and frustration because of still not knowing where my daughter is. And I think everyone, everyone can sympathize with that. Furthermore, I would also like to clarify a false rumor that has been circulating in the press. I never asked or demanded from the Aruban government to pay an amount of United States dollars, $200,000 to the Texas EquiSearch team. Never. Because I know what I have explained to the family, as I just did, that with or without pressure, our legal system is uh, entails that the investigation the investigation will continue regardless if there is pressure from outside or not they're an independent investigation as is embedded in our legal system and the, it will continue you know she kind of had to or was forced to give that press conference because you know people were turning against her right not a retraction but just kind of uh soften the blow. yeah soften clarification maybe so all this time you know the People are detained, they're questioned, and they're yeah. let go, but they're still looking for Natalie. Sure. I mean, now at this point, they're, they've got, what, a handful of fighter jets. I call them fighter jets. They're, you know, they're F-16s, so. Yeah, you know, I, yeah aircraft, but they got in, infrared sensors. Yeah, they're up there. They're looking at the topography, right, and compare them to previous satellite photos to, to determine if they can... I guess you can tell if there's a divot or a, a, a raised area that. But I think it's we talked about it in the last episode on. Uh, oh yeah, West Mesa. West Mesa. Yeah. Right, they're looking for a change in in the ground. Right. That would indicate a grave. Right. Basically, is what they were doing, and then you've got a um, you've got a couple of people that come forward in the late July. Oh, the gardener. Yeah, you got the gardener, who basically says that you're on Vandersloot was attempting to hide his face as he was driving into the racket club. He had both Calpo brothers with him. And this was on the morning of May 30th between 2.30 and 3 o'clock. So it's later in the evening now, right? We went from 2 to 2.30. Now we're pushing 3. So none of the stories match. But but again, it's at nighttime. But he's trying to hide his face when he pulls in. Yeah. Now, as a result of him saying that, they had to drain a pond at this Aruba Racket Club, which was close to the Marriott Hotel Beach, which right. was part of one of his stories, right? See, it's it's getting so con convoluted because he's he's telling so many different stories, and that one it'll just get worse. Oh yeah, it gets much worse. It, yeah, absolutely. And then you've got the um, so you got the gardener, and then you've got the jogger who claimed to have seen men burying uh, burying a blonde haired woman in a landfill during the afternoon of May 30th. Which is, okay, so she's got that that night, right? And when I say that night, it's really that morning. May 30th, May right. May 30th, and they're saying... A.M. In the afternoon, daylight, he's saying he's seen people bury, bury this, you know, a blonde woman. Yeah. But doesn't 
report it until now. Yeah, because we're this is late July, so yeah, so two strange. months. He waits two months to report it. Yeah, but you know the police searched this landfill. They searched it actually the in the days after Natalie's disappearance, for whatever reason. I don't know if they were just tipped or if they thought that was a good place to search. Right. But then after they searched it three different times after the jogger comes forward, including. Uh, a search where the FBI brings in cadaver dog. So they did, they hit it hard and nothing came out of either one of those uh, tips. So we know at this point that the Holloway's offer an award for a safe return and they take that award, which was, I guess was originally 200,000 and they make it a million dollars with $100,000 reward for any information leading to the location of Natalie. So a million dollars if you can bring her back or, or lead us to get her back. And a hundred thousand if you've got any information that helps us find her. Yeah. Now when they started, it the reward was fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. So it's increased over time. Yeah. And I think like you said, it was at two hundred and then it went to a million. And then ultimately the reward for just the information about her remains that led to her remains would be raised from a hundred to two fifty. So they're, you know, they're ratcheting up both of these different rewards. I mean, there, there is no doubt. I mean that, you know, Beth and George and her, her real dad, they're trying everything. Oh, to the point they even get the FBI government to get the, the local, uh, Reuben police and investigators, to bring information that they had and, and they fly, you know, they fly to Quantico. Right. Right. And they sit down with the FBI and they review everything with them at Quantico using, I would assume the best technology and in criminal investigation that you can have. One of the pieces of evidence that they sent back to Quantico was a uh, piece of duct tape that was found. And apparently it had some strands of blonde hair attached to it that I know they had to have thought was Natalie's. I think they were hopeful. They were hopeful. And they tested it not only at Quantico, but also independently at a Dutch lab. The FBI announced that the hair was not Natalie's. So that right there, you know, whoever they were going to tie it to, it didn't matter because. Yeah. Wasn't, it wasn't useful in this case. Yeah. But strange enough, go back to Aruba, right? And on, August 26, they make a rearrest of the brothers. They rearrest Deepak and, and Satish, Satish, the Calpo brothers. The Calpo brothers. They bring in a new suspect. You're going to have to help me out on this name, Mike. Freddie. Freddie Aaron Batsy. Batsy. That's what I'm going with. Yeah. And I guess he was taking some photographs and having some physical contact with underage girls. So that's what got him and pulled into this group. Well, and I think this, uh, what I read Gibbs was that this incident that caused them to look at this Freddie guy, uh, allegedly occurred way before in time before the Holloway disappearance. But what tied it all together was that supposedly your and Vandersloot and both of the Calpo brothers were involved in this as well. Right. So kind of like a track record. Yeah. So I don't know if they thought, you know, bring in Freddie because maybe he can help us tie everything together. And just try to pressure the the brothers into confessing to something maybe by having all that laid out in front of them and have them back in uh, custody or detention, as they call it there. Yeah. And I think this was a little unpopular with the Reuben people. Right. I think they saw through this as, uh, and it, like you said, an attempt to pressure the Calpo brothers into talking and ultimately was unsuccessful because, you know, in sept, sept, early, early September, all four people are, are released by a judge. So at this point, everybody's out. Yep. Now, in addition to that, on September 14th, the judge lifted all restrictions for all four of these people. So you got Yorin, 
the two Calpo brothers, Freddie, who I'm not even sure was involved in right. anything other than. So now they can, I guess, they, they can travel. They, they can, can go anywhere they they're want f- to. They're free to do what they want. Yeah. Okay. Now that, again, that's one of the things that I think Beth Holloway had a, a Twitty had a really big problem with is the ability for them to just up and leave while this investigation was still going on. So by this time, the news coverage of the Natalie Holloway case had diminished considerably. Right. Interest is dropping. Well, do you know why? I don't know why. A little thing happened called Hurricane Katrina. Is that what happened? August of 2005. I remember that, though. I just... Well, everybody remembers that. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. So August of 2005 is when Hurricane Katrina hit. Yeah. So that would have been kind of while a lot of this was going on that we've been talking about. And there was a lot of speculation that this is why they chose when they did to release the four suspects is because the scrutiny wasn't there quite as much as it was before. Right. Because Hurricane Katrina, you remember, was so big. Absolutely. That all me, you know, almost all media attention, especially in the U S shifted, shifted yeah. to cover that. And that went on for, quite a while because if you, you know, you remember the aftermath was oh unbelievable. Was huge. Yeah. There was so many different stories that came out uh, over the years. I mean, there was a, uh, a an interview where, you know, uh, Vandersloot said that, you know, Holloway wanted to have sex with him and the two brothers, but they didn't have a condom. So they didn't do that. And so they left her on the beach and then he felt bad for leaving her on the beach. But I think that's hard to believe. I think anybody uh, hears that story. I don't think they they believe that whatsoever. So even after even after they talk about him alleging that she wanted to have sex with him, right? We get past that. And then down the road, we have someone from the local police again. They give an interview to somebody at CBS, and I think this was around March 25th, 2006. And I, I think at this point, they just want the case to be over because he, he, you know, this, this spokesperson states that they believe that Hall, you know, Holloway's dead and that she died from self-consumed uh, alcohol. Um, so, I mean, they're saying there is no wrongdoing, that she did it to herself. And basically that they're over it. You know, they've, well, I, they've got over what? Three, $4 million. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think, I think part of that is the fact that they've spent over $3 million on the investigation. Yeah. Which by all accounts is about 40% of their total budget. Right. Uh, for the, you know, I guess for the year. And, and I, I just think that the, the locals have run thin on this, right? The government uh, and, and, they, and they are all wanting to move on. All right, Mike. So I think we're up to, April 27th, 2007. And this is when about 20 investigators do a search at the Vandersloot family residence in Aruba. Right. It's uh, Dutch authorities. They're searching the yard. They're using shovels. They're, they're using these metal rods to kind of push down through the dirt. I think they have a feeling that Natalie was buried there maybe. Yeah. And that's why they did that search. Because what else would they be looking for in the dirt except for her body? Right. But nothing comes about it. No, nothing comes up at all. And they never, they never, investigators were never able to tell anybody what prompted the search. But we know that a few weeks later they go over to the Deepak's house and they do another search there as well. Again, nothing, nothing comes about it. There's nothing significant to add to the case. And so at that point, the searches are over. All right, Gibbs. So this is how crazy this story gets, right? Because in November of 2007, Joran Vandersloot, Satish, and Deepak Kalpo are all rearrested. Yeah. Again. Again. I mean, their homes had just been searched just a few months ago. Now they're rearrested in November. 
and they're arrested on what is called suspicion of involvement in manslaughter and causing serious bodily harm that resulted in the death of Natalie Holloway. But that didn't last very long. No. You know, it's like seven, eight days later, the judge says, you got to release Satish and Deepak. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, re- they're released. Yoren was released on December 7th due to lack of evidence. And then on December 18th, the prosecutor officially declared the case closed and that no charges would be filed due to lack of evidence. Yeah, which means because they didn't have a body. Yeah. If you don't have the body, it's hard to prove. It's hard to prove most things in this type of case. But the interest in the three of them continues. Oh, yeah, this keeps going, man. I mean, there is, at one point, allegations that one of the three of them in a chat room had stated that Holloway was dead. So then, Gib, we, we got to move to January of 2008. And, and this is where, you know, again, things get interesting because you got a Dutch crime reporter who claims to the world that he solved the Natalie Holloway case. Right. And he's actually getting ready to air on Dutch television secret recordings of Joran van der Sloot confessing to the crime. And basically what happened was he had wired uh, a vehicle for sound. And I'm not sure how this part happened, but he got this guy named Patrick van der Fem, who was a Dutch businessman and ex-convict who had apparently gained the confidence of, of Joran van der Sloot. So they're kind of like buddies now. Yeah. And they got into the car together, which was wired. Joran is smoking marijuana and he's talking. And basically he's saying that he was with Natalie Holloway and she began convulsively shaking, became unresponsive. He goes on to state that, you know, he attempted to revive her and then he called a friend and this friend told Vandersloot to go home and that he would dispose of the body. So this is what he's saying. You know, the tape is in Dutch, so I can't play it, but people can go on YouTube and, and it's subtitled so you can basically see what he's saying. So I'm guessing when the authorities hear this tape, does it spark some interest? Well, I think what it does is it reopens, it causes the um, prosecutor in Aruba to reopen the case. Okay. So he meets, then, so he meets with the investigators uh, around February 8th, and then he basically tells them, hey, what was on the tape? It's not true. Yeah, I, I think he said that was he, under, was, yeah. he was just telling this guy a story. And under the influence of the, of the marijuana. Yeah, smoking weed, and I'm just telling this guy a story to sound cool or I don't know if that's exactly the words he used, but, but either way at this point, he still maintains that he was with Natalie, but he left her on the beach. Yeah. Right. And he sticks with that and nothing else comes of it, but it's another instance of him telling another story. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, his story version of what happened. Yeah. His stories are just piling up and they don't stop. Right. Because in November, you know, Yoron decides to do, an interview with Fox news in which he has a new story. Okay. And this story, he's saying that he sold Natalie Holloway into sexual slavery. So he kidnaps her and ships her 10 miles across the ocean to Venezuela. Yeah. Well, let's hear what he has to say. Okay. Not because she was interested in me, I guess, because she was, yeah, because she was coming up, uh, she was coming up, come dance with me, and that's when I when I when I was remembering this guy, and he, like, I think it was more than two days before that even he gave me his uh, uh, card with his phone number on it, and yeah, I thought he was just one like maybe looking to have a good time, go out. I don't know. I did not know 100 percent whatever his intentions were. I still don't know right now what his exact intentions were. So he asks me first, let's go to your let's go to your house. I want to go to your house. I want to see your house. I'm like no. Let's go back to let's go back to your hotels right next to it was right next to the other where we had to be anyway. Thought we could go see there, see how it is there. But she didn't want to go back to her own hotel. So then uh, that's when I told the guys to drop us off by the by the Marriott. 
and said that yeah, no, I'm in the car now and uh, I'm with a girl and I'm with two friends and uh, what are you doing? And he's like, yeah, I'm awake. And then he's like, okay, can you be there and there in an hour? And I'm gonna have someone there. And I'm like, okay, to give you your money. So what he said, and I'm like, okay. Uh, then I got out, stepped out of the car. And she was with me, went to, to the beach with her and uh, we were just making out. We never did anything else. And uh, then uh, at first I didn't see anyone there. I didn't know anything. And I was like, okay, whatever, you know, it's not gonna happen. Then I saw a guy, and he came, and he just handed me a bag, grabbed the, the girl by the arm, and he went to the boat that he had in the water. Then I, I went home, I called, uh, I called uh, Deepak up, and he sent Satish to come pick me up. One night I paid, other night he paid, and I gave them both a thousand. I didn't tell them how much I was getting for it first. Afterwards, I told them. So, my question is, all along he's claimed that he didn't kill her, he didn't hurt her, but now he's going to switch a story that implicates him in orchestrating her sale in a sex ring yeah. slavery. I, I, I just don't get it. Either one of these three, if you were being held and knew the severity of what could happen to you, why wouldn't you, if that's really what happened, why wouldn't you just come, come out and say, hey... You know, he, he sold her to some sex trade human trafficking group. Um, she's probably over in Venezuela. And uh, he paid us a thousand bucks each. So why, why wouldn't the brothers come clean on that? Um, because at that point, you know, the theory is that she's alive, right? You're, well, not, you're not looking at murder. And they went through a lot. If you think about it, the Calpo brothers were arrested multiple times. Yeah had their houses searched. If that's what really went down, their part in it would have been not very minuscule. Yeah. Driving the car, maybe. So they would have rolled. Yeah. I that, think that's so. my thought. I think if that was a true, true version of what happened, that that would have came out earlier. Yeah. I, I just think he is a compulsive liar. Yeah. And he's just inventing stories. Um, because obviously that interview was much, much longer I cut it down to to just what I thought was the most important part, which was him admitting that, you know, he played a role in this sale, I guess you would call it. All right, Gibbs. So we got to talk about the next crazy twist in this whole Natalie Holloway case. And obviously it involves Joran Vandersloot because everything seems to. Right. And this is really one of the, I guess one of the craziest chapters in this case. Yeah, this really, man, just gets more twisted. Yeah, so this, this happens in March of 2009. They basically have gone through several years of not much happening. Nobody's getting any answers. There's no new leads. And Vandersloot reaches out to Natalie's family, I think through their attorney. And he says that he knows the location of Natalie's body and he's willing to cooperate with them and lead them to Natalie's body. But he wants $250,000 okay. in exchange for this information. So they actually give him an advance of 10%. They give him $25,000 because they're so desperate at this point to find out what happened to their daughter. Sure. Makes sense. And unfortunately, everything that he says turns out to be fake, mm. which I believe everything he said up to this point is fake as well. Right. So, I mean, I don't, I don't blame them for trying anything and everything, but you know, at some point you got to realize this guy is, is just can't be trusted at all. Twist it. Yeah. He, it's very twisted. Now he isn't, he's indicted for, wire fraud and extortion, but you know, it doesn't matter because he never gets the chance to answer for what he did. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But, say, what was that? Mike? Yeah. But first let's, well, I got a clip of, of, uh, Vandersloot. For everything that happened since 2005, uh, all the, the things said in the media, um, 
everything I feel guilty for. Yeah, I was doing a lot of things that I I shouldn't have been I shouldn't have been doing, and mostly only going out all the night and sleeping all the day. I have always been very uh, how you call it uh, um, impulsive. Always been uh, take a action right away and make a decision immediately and not think about what the consequences are. There were people who were paying me to paying me to yeah to make up stories and I was really good at making up stories. Everybody keeps coming at you, asking you questions, asking you stuff and yeah, you don't know something and finally you you start to think, okay well, well you if you if you want something then then I'll tell you whatever you want to hear, sure. I misused the situation for my own advantage and I feel bad about that and if I could change that I, I, I would take it back for sure. I have had five years long that people have just been blaming me for something and and yeah I have a lot of anger built up because of that also and yeah at one point I just thought that uh, okay you know you keep insisting that you you want to give me this money. I've already told uh, a lot of different stories. I'll do it. Uh, I'll do it again. And yeah, I know it's very wrong. Uh, very wrong what I did. When I speak to the judge and the time is right, I, I am gonna. I, I'm gonna tell the whole truth. Absolutely. It's a whole web of problems, but I created all of them myself. So uh, yeah, I have to to deal with it now. Deal with the consequences. So that was interesting. Yeah. So so did they ever say who? Did he ever say who paid him to tell these stories? Because that's what he says. He says, you know, at one point he says, you know, I was paid to tell stories. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I know in one, he's talking about this money he got from Natalie's okay. family. Right. But I don't know who else he's talking about that's paying him to, yeah. to tell these stories. Interesting. What's amazing is, though, he takes the 25000 Yeah. And he goes to Peru. I'm not sure why, but he decides that the best course of action for him is to go to Peru. And he's over there. He's gambling. He's just, you know, blowing all this money. Right. And he meets a woman, a 20, 21 year old business student named Stephanie Ramirez. So what happens to Stephanie? is that she's found dead three days later after she meets Joran Vandersloot okay. in a hotel room registered in his name. So unlike Natalie's case, where the evidence is circumstantial, the evidence in this Ramirez case... Got some physical evidence. It's overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, it's pointing at nobody but Joran Vandersloot. So, number one, they got video footage of Stephanie Ramirez and Yoran entering his hotel room together. And then they have him leaving by himself. And it wasn't for three days that they found her. In the meantime, he's in Chile. So, he's fled to Chile. And they capture him a few days after the, the discovery of her body. Now, the Chilean authorities, after they find him, they state that what they find on him uh, is money allegedly stolen from the murder victim. But even more damning than that is that apparently Yoran had bloody clothing on his person, and that pretty much sealed the deal. Yeah. DNA. So they extraditing to Peru to stand trial for the Ramirez murder. So while Yoran is in a Peruvian prison, Beth Holloway, Twitty, Natalie's mom, is able to sneak into the prison with a Dutch film crew. This is getting interesting. Yeah. So the Dutch film crew apparently is there to interview him. Okay. What he does, what Joran doesn't know is that she's coming with him. Okay. So he just thinks this Dutch crew's coming. Yes. He doesn't realize she's going to be the one asking the questions. And she was able to spend, I think it was about five minutes. Okay. Alone 
with Jorn. Well, not alone because the Dutch film, they were taping it. Right. But I, I want to play some of it because it's very interesting. What you're looking at spending the rest of your life in prison, you're on. And I know you want to make a plea deal in Peru and in Aruba in the U.S. And I've met with the prosecutors and I've met with the Flores family. And you're on. I won't do anything until I get some information about Natalie. But it's your life. It's too late for Natalie. It's too late for Stephanie. It's too late for me. But it's not too late for you, you're on, to, to get your life back. You don't need to lose your life here in prison and be sitting here when you're 60 years of age and insisting to me that you don't know what happened. If it was an accident, tell me. You know, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I am. I'm here. I, I hope you can understand also that it's very hard uh, hard for, for, for me to talk to you. It's, it's really not easy. I'm really doing my best. To, no. I know you have a very good heart. And I know that. I know that for a fact. I don't know if you would mind uh, just uh, giving me some, I, I really have been thinking a lot, and just giving me some, some time to think, and I promise you, even if you give me your address, I, I, I will write you. I owe you at least that. I mean, I've made so many bad decisions, and all for, for the wrong reasons. I hope you know that I'm really very addicted to per person, especially to gambling. I mean, that's why I've told so many lies and other stuff, just so I have money and just so I can go gamble with. That's I, honestly the truth. The reasons why I did all those things and how horrible they were, but I promise you, if you give me your address, I'll uh, Okay, I will, I will. And is this your attorney's number? Yeah, this is fine. All right. I don't really understand what this means, but, you know, I think that you might, and I just wanted to get face to face with you, and, you know, I, I feel like when I go back in time, you're on, you know, five years ago, I'm thinking, you know, I felt like, I felt like you didn't listen to me then, that I wanted to just, let's, you know, tell me what happened, and let me take her home. It's always been my problem. I've never listened to anyone who's meant well for me. I've always done what I myself wanted, or what I myself thought was best, and even after, I should have learned from my mistakes, still, always the same stuff. Now I've had a lot of time here also now to, to think and do other stuff. I really do. I really do want to write you. I just need some some time to think about how, what I want to say. And okay. I and I, say it and I would appreciate it if you'd give me that also. I will. I will. And I, I really, so you know why I'm here. Is I, I, do I want to know answers and I want to know what happened. So she's trying so hard yeah. to get something out of him. And, and all he keeps saying is, well, give me your address and I'll write you. Right. We're kind of blowing her off, really. Yeah. But I, I think he was surprised by the fact that she showed up. You know, I don't think he was ready for her. But it was amazing. I thought that she was able to get in. And um, what what you can't hear, because I cut it off, was they kind of bust in on him a little bit right there. Realize that she shouldn't be in there and kind of break it up. So Joran Vandersloot pled guilty to murdering... Stephanie Ramirez on January 11, 2012. He ended up getting a sentence of 28 years in prison. I don't know what that means in Peru. Yeah, I don't either. I don't know how many years he has to serve before he... Right. Yeah. So the story that, as I understand it, is that... And you heard him talk about being addicted to gambling. Yeah. And I think he blew through that 25000 pretty quickly. Yeah, he did. And I think one of the one of the theories is is that he killed um, Stephanie Ramirez for money. Mm -hmm. He robbed her because he had this addiction to gambling. But there was some other stuff that I read that thought that maybe she knew something on him. Either he had told her something, or she'd stumbled on to some kind of evidence related to the Nat Natalie Holloway case. Okay. And that's why he killed her. I, I don't know another which rabbit is which. Hole. Yeah. Another rabbit hole like we talk about. Right. It only took a couple hours of police interrogation for him to admit to killing Ramirez. His side of the story was that they got in an argument. 
so the interesting part is though, apparently he left the hotel. She was in his room. When he came back, he found her going through his laptop. And I think that's the reason why there's speculation that she may have found something on his laptop that had something to do with Natalie's case. Enraged him, I guess. And maybe she confronted him. Whatever happened, they got in a big fight and he killed her. Okay. The other thing that happened was that apparently he offered to finally reveal the location of Natalie's body in exchange for extradition back to Aruba. But the Peruvian government, they didn't give a shit about it at all. They said no. Uh, they said they, they weren't interested. Yeah. Probably didn't believe them anyway. Yeah, they probably didn't at this point. But they said they didn't care about anything but keeping him there to serve the time for the murder. For killing the per- per- Peruvian. That he had, yeah, that yeah. he had committed there. Yeah. So whether, whether he really knew or whether, again, he's just talking as he does likes to do. So one day after he was convicted of the um, Ramirez murder, an Alabama court declared Natalie Holloway legally dead. Pretty sad. It is. But we are, we're, what, seven years? Six and a half years, seven years. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, Gibbs, her parents, heartbroken. Yeah, They will always be heartbroken. Well, there's no closure. They'll never, yeah. Right now, unless something new comes up, and the you know the problem is, and I don't know how you feel, but to me Vandersloot's the key. Yeah, he's in the middle of all of it, and he's stuck in a jail, and his information is unreliable, even if he knows the truth. Yeah, you don't. Would, no matter what he tells, and at this point, if he gives a location, would the body even be there? Yeah, who knows? Yeah, you really don't know. I hope. That he writes her, and I hope he tells her what location, and I hope that she's able to go there and dig and actually find the remains so that she gets, you know, and and the father gets closure. That's what I hope. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, that's the only thing that they can, yeah. they can hope for. I mean, could she still be alive? She could be. Yeah. If she really was sold into some type of you know, sex slave ring. Technically she could be alive. Right. But seven, you know, even in human trafficking, I think that the outcome is pretty bleak. All right, Gibby. So there's so many twists and turns in this case. There is. And there's one more that I want to talk about and it doesn't surface until 2015. Okay. So just a couple of years ago, there was a new witness that came forward and basically said that he saw Yoron Vandersloot bury Natalie Holloway back in 2005. Now, I know your first question is, why do you wait 10 years to come forward? That's exactly what my question is. Because I know you. But apparently he said that she was buried underneath this new fancy hotel. I don't know if it's a Marriott. It's some big hotel in Aruba. Okay. That was under construction in 2005. So let's play. I got a little clip of this guy. I know what happened to Natalie Holloway. I saw that Joran was chasing Natalie into a small building under construction. After five minutes, he came out with her, his arms, and he slammed the body of Natalie on the floor. And then he made an opening in the crawl space and pulled it by the ankles inside of the crawl space. I saw a crime passing for my eyes, but I was also in that moment busy with illegal activities. So I didn't know what to do. If I was making this up, this would be the work of a, of a man who is, not, who is insane. You know, I'm, uh, and I don't consider, me, consider myself insane. No, he could be insane. I don't know. But it answers our question. It does. Right, because he was involved in some illegal activities and felt like he couldn't come forward. Right. And when I first heard this and I first started reading about it, I was kind of very intrigued that maybe something could come of it. Unfortunately, then as I as I researched further, I found out that 
you know, they did look into this very seriously and they worked with the, um, I think it's the Marriott, but they worked with hotel officials to go back and, and timeline it. Yeah. Go through the timeline. And at the time that Natalie disappeared, they, the construction was not to the point that this guy says it was like, he talks about buildings and crawl spaces and they were able to document the fact that it couldn't possibly be true. So they didn't even look in the crawl space area. I'm guessing yeah, I, they figure it wasn't valid. Yeah. They, I mean, all I, all I know is they were able to discount him. You and I could sit here and talk for probably another two or three hours about all the different shoots, offshoots of things that happened and theories. And, but to me, I still go back and I'm not saying anybody did it that I know anybody did it. Right. But if you were to ask me, I would say you're on Vandersloot and the Calpo brothers know something. I would agree. Whether they did it or know who did it, they they're at the center of of all of this and until one of them I think chooses to speak out, the case will never be solved. Yeah, I agree. All right, well that was the case of uh Natalie Holloway. You know, it's uh it's sad that um the family doesn't have the closure that they need and uh but you know, this is one that you know, down the road could be solved. Could if, be. If the right person steps forward and has legitimate information. There's three people that know. Yep. All right. So for Mike and uh, Gibby, stay safe and keep your own time ticking. <laughs>